brace yourself because you're about to dive into another free first hour episode of the Higher Side Chats. And we just want to let you know that whether you're looking for a companion through your paranoid insomnia, entertaining yourself through one of life's mundane activities, or trying to ward off the internal screams of all those sad, smothered souls around the office, THC is here. And you should know that every episode of the Higher Side Chats has an entire second hour for Plus members. Sign up at thehiresidechatsplus.com and you'll get years of Plus show archives, lifetime forum access, a special invite to Greg Carlwood's monthly joint sessions, MP3s of THC music, bonus episodes, tour videos, and 10% off t-shirts, grinders, and whatever else ends up in the Higher Side store. It's $8 a month that you won't miss, so become a Plus member and treat yourself in these troubled times. Always action-packed and commercial-free, which means you'll unfortunately never hear my voice again. In the 1930s, President Franklin Delano Roosevelt addressed the nation through a series of radio broadcasts known as the Fireside Chats. His aim was to reassure the common man that our society would recover from its troubled times. Well, we're far from 1930, and I deal with a different kind of fire. For a new era of worldly frustration, we offer a fresh conversation. I'm Greg Carlwood, and these are the Higher Side Chats. All right, people from sunny San Diego, I'm Greg Carlwood, and when we look at the history of Archon-infected empire expansion, it's clearly carved a very cold and bloody path to the place we are today. In fact, it's almost impossible to truly reel back its influence, its baggage, and the occupation of ideas that still poison the mental well of humanity. Just look at something like language or even food, and you'll see how quickly empire comes up. In the context of spirituality and magic, this often means that any Westerners interested in rejecting the materialist model or the angry dad in the clouds paradigm were presented with, and walking down the path less traveled, will usually start with the works of Manly P. Hall, Aleister Crowley, Blavatsky, the Golden Dawn, or any of the initiatory orders or secret societies that not only dominate the literature, but often have too cozy of a relationship with the state to make me all that comfortable myself. But eventually the Western blinders come off and we see that magic and spirituality are about as universal as they get. And only because of the brutal steamroll of colonization have we lost that understanding and oftentimes the fractured communities in their wake as well. And today I think many of us are looking back at the cultures and people that the power pyramid has used and abused and are trying to unpack their ways and their understandings of life and reality because the answers yielded by the all-knowing empire are not nearly good enough. So with us here today is Natalia L. Forty, a writer, storyteller, cardomancer, and advocate of the magical worldview from Puerto Rico, who details her journey on her blog, Mist and Ether. She's pursued her education in literary theory and criticism with undergraduate studies in English literature. She's also the author of The Poetic Arcanum and The Otherworldly Journey with the Suit of Swords, where she combines storytelling and poetry with the rich and deep symbolism of the tarot. So let's do it. The Caribbean cardomancer, lover of literature, and devonatrix extraordinaire, Natalia, welcome to THC. Wow, that is an excellent introduction. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> I try, I try. And thanks for doing this. It's always exciting when I ask someone if they'd be interested in being a guest, and they're actually a listener already, so that was nice. And the real catalyst for asking was this piece you wrote called The Politics of Unnamed Desires, which we'll get into, and it seems like it's far more political than your usual writings, but I found it right at a time when I was also thinking about the fact that I'd love to have more guests from outside the Western bubble, or at least talk to people more embedded and raised in the cultures that not only have deep spiritual and magical traditions, but also have been impacted pretty dramatically by colonization. And Puerto Rico seems like it checks both of those boxes pretty boldly, and it still has a lot of struggle and turmoil caused by its odd nebulous status with the United States. So I think you'll have a lot of interesting things to share with us. I suppose this might be one of your first podcast appearances. So maybe we could start with where you might have either have seen either of those two things growing up, spiritualism and magic or the negative effects of colonization. How do those things impact a person born and raised in the Caribbean? Oh, goodness. 
That is quite a question. Ooh. All right. Well, I wasn't raised in Puerto Rico. I was raised in Florida where, you know, there are many, many Puerto Ricans. And I came to Puerto Rico to study, to continue my um, higher education. So I transferred to the University of Puerto Rico. So it was a big culture shock. So just with that alone, I was raised with not a, I guess, grounded identity, you could say, because I, I wasn't a part of Florida. You know, I'm Puerto Rican. So I lived there. I was raised there. But in part, it wasn't my culture, you know. And then I came here. And that was the case as well. <laughs> I found a great culture shock. And of course, I visited Puerto Rico, you know, frequently every year. And I think I've always kept retained this feeling of not belonging anywhere. And I think that what I feel in living here, because I also, you know, I've, I've moved around quite a bit. I think there is a lot of inarticulated, especially here in Puerto Rico, not belonging. You know, we belong to this land. You know, we are all Puerto Rican. We have this shared culture. So we belong. Right. But I think the one of the one of the deepest fissures in, in colonization that happens in, in the individual is that it disconnects you from the land and from community. And this is the, the type of this is the landscape that you find here, you know, amongst people. There is just a, a disparate feeling that is connection through culture, but is superficial cult culture. You know, a lot of our culture is derived from the United States, you know, with, with, you know, we've been colonized for more than 500 years. First it was the Spanish, then it was the U.S. And we haven't, that's why I titled my article Unnamed Desires, because we do not even know how to articulate who we are, where we fit, we, because we haven't even given, you know, we, we don't take, we don't know. Not that we don't take that. You know, there's nothing to take because what can we take? You know, we're on, we're an island, a small island. So all that, all that frustration <laughs> is what you feel living here, you know? Mm -hmm. But there's a lot of, as usual, I'm in the States, you know, competition, et cetera, et cetera. But there is a lot of thievery, piracy, <laughs> a lot of, as you know, corruption as in the States, as in many other places. But here it's, it just has a different feeling to it. I don't know. And I think it's because we don't, we don't have the sense of place and of belonging. And so with uh, spiritual communities here, I think that is one of the ways that we retain a sense of community. You know, one of the one of the ways because there are also people that you know don't belong to any spiritual communities. But in spiritual communities, you find relief. You know, the, the, you're able to communicate, and you know, even if even if certain things are unaddressed and unsaid, but the living. The daily living and the daily pulling through, that is addressed in spiritual communities. And I think that is why, they're, you know, communities is a, is a big thing here, spiritual communities. You know, even the Christians and, you know, the different denominations, the different types of communities outside of Christianity as well, spiritism, and also in, you know, Santeria and all the, you know, other different communities, spiritual communities. Well, I think that makes a lot of sense. I mean, even just to see something like you use the tarot a lot, and it seems like you're using a Spanish tarot deck. I mean, that in itself is like, well, clearly there's some major influence. And it's got to be a strange feeling of not having a ton of autonomy. Yes. Because you always have this overarching yes. Uh, empire. Yes, that's the word I was looking for. <laughs> yes. And even even just the idea of not really knowing where you're from or not having a connection with your heritage. I think that's big for any American because you go back a couple hundred years and none of us were originally from here. So mm -hmm. sometimes I think about just the idea of, okay, so I'm largely Swedish and Polish. Well, you know, how different would life be if you were raised in a place where your entire city is Swedish and Polish with a heritage that goes back generations? And it's kind of crazy. And let me be clear, this is not something 
voiced. You know, this is not something articulated. I'm it, I, this. What I'm saying could be heretic, heretical in a sense to a lot of people. They will deny it. Like, what is? What are you talking about? But it. It. You see it every day because it's complete disregard to the land. You know, here in in, in Puerto Rico, I, the highest bidder is the one that takes the piece. You know, and and especially if they come from outside. You know, and all all our land is is sold. You know is sold disregarding, you know, whoever lived there, whoever they have to move so that this high, this other can purchase this land or this place. And you see it here in the, the people as well. I mean, the, the amount of trash that you find, I, I mean, I see it just driving people just throw trash out the window, you know, a bottle here, <laughs> you know, a, a, a beer can over there. And it's, you know, and there's just, that is a sign of a person that has no regard for the land that they walk on, you know, that they belong here, that they should, they should participate in some way other than, than, than just let me see how far I can get ahead above this other person. You know, let me see how, who I can bring down today, <laughs> you know, like that. Right. The warped ways of the West are definitely contagious. We get caught up in the wrong incentives and all that. Yeah. And I'm not surprised that someone who moved to Puerto Rico because they're Puerto Rican and was hoping to feel more connected has these sorts of thoughts about the land on their mind because it seems like even the native population is dealing with their own disconnect. Mm -hmm. Either conscious or unconscious, these feelings of defeat, because there's a big international mining corporation raping the land, poisoning the water. So an individual could easily feel like, well, fuck it. What's the use in finding a trash can when this shit's going on over there? Mm -hmm. I could definitely understand that sort of stuck feeling. Yes. And just a little bit more about the history. You sum up the story really well with this paragraph from that post where you say, since the quote-unquote discovery of Puerto Rico by the Europeans, the island quickly moved into the possession of Spain, under which the land was mined into exhaustion, all the gold and riches immediately shipped back to the continent, the indigenous people of the land mixed, died, or went into slavery. Typical story of the Caribbean, right? Puerto Rico isn't unique in this. What this island is particularly unique in is that after centuries under Spanish rule and a mild skirmish between the Spanish and the British over ownership, the United States took over after the Spanish-American War. The island passed now into the ownership of a new head, a new banner, and a new culture. Are you seeing a thread here? Speed up a couple hundred years and here we are, still under the wings of the United States. At no point in our history longer than a day after the Europeans stepped foot on the island, have the people of the island been sovereign? If you sit and think about that fact and about the repercussions this reverberates into a people, into the land, well, it's quite something. It is crippling. <laughs> and I just think that is a killer paragraph. Definitely heavy. Also, I listened to those Sancista Brujo Luis interviews that you had sent me which fold in the magical context within this unique history, and he refers to Puerto Rico as a big magical melting pot. Mm -hmm. Not only are there many traditions across the islands, but Puerto Rico is also the first place that African slaves were brought to, so their traditions have folded in and mixed as well. And then, of course, you've got to add that Christianity current running through everything. And it just seems like after all this history... It's pretty safe to say that Puerto Rico is a fairly unique and interesting cultural and magical microcosm, isn't it? Yeah, it it is. I mean, you can find that in other places in the Caribbean and obviously in other places in, in different countries. But yeah, some it it created quite an interesting mix here. And and now you have, you know, you have Espiritismo, you have Espiritismo Cruzado folklorico like different you know and that it just those are just different branches of spiritism you know kardecian spiritism that got you know absorbed into different ways of life and different cultures that came from other places and they just made it their own you know within the community you know those different communities that took the kardecian spiritism and made it their own and and transformed it in in many ways and it's i think it's beautiful yeah yeah. 
what traditions maybe seem the most popular and how widespread is magic and spiritualism down there? Because, of course, if you've lived in Florida, I know you also lived in Seattle, almost non-existent. Yeah. <laughs> how far does it penetrate down there? It's pretty deep. I mean, and and obviously it depends on the house, on the on the temple and the different spiritist house, but it is popular to approach spiritism and it is said that that is the foundation. You know, whichever other branch you want to follow, whichever other tradition you want to follow, spiritism provides the foundation with how to work with ancestors and how to work las causas and things like that 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 provide a foundation so if you when you move into another tradition you have that that solid base that gives you the tools for spirit work basically mm -hmm. for working with spirits and interacting with spirits and recognizing different types of spirits and things like that obviously each tradition has their own spirits and ways of recognizing i don't want to you know i'm not part I don't know, you know, each temple is different, but I do know that it is popular to approach spiritism from that perspective, that it is the foundation. So you begin there and you refine your, you know, you, you hone your skills as a spirit worker through spiritism. And then you start, you know, evolving, moving, meeting other temples, other people. And from there you branch out and your path is made clear, I guess. It's the way to see it. Right on. So. You mentioned that you're part of a spiritist house. Can you tell us anything more about yours and why you might have chose it over others? Well, I don't know that in my case, I didn't really choose it. <laughs> I just found myself going there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it was because I was, I met this person through a job and I, I, I knew her and our you know, our friendship and relationship grew through that job. And then I met my partner. And from there, he also had a friendship with her. And we began forming part of her group and going to, you know, the sesiones and misas and all that. And it just slowly evolved because we weren't part of it immediately we just went you know to the special days you know special celebrations for the saints and things like that participated and but then slowly we began integrating ourselves more and now i'm part of it <laughs> <laughs> so is it the spiritual hierarchies that define a spiritualist house versus another one or is it more of the contact techniques or a little of both hmm. i don't know that there are hierarchies no i don't f that's not no so uh, you mean like different types of temples what would be the difference i think it's the approach so some temples are the approach so some temples are heavy in the you know kardec kardecian spiritism and they have a specific structure and how they address it and they're more temple uh, they're more of a temple where you go to a temple, you know, a building. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And other places are in a home, in a home beside a home, you know, a structure beside the, beside the home. And so they, they each vary in approach. And it's not by hierarchies. I think it's more approach. And I haven't, I haven't visited uh, that many temples either. But it's what I've noticed is from is the approach, basically. I mean, they have the same structures, you know, you open with the prayers and oraciones escogida, which is a small book with prayers. You know, you open the same way, but some have more steps and others have less steps. Some have, it, it's just, I think it, it's more structural than anything. Right on, right on. Maybe hierarchy is the wrong word to use, and pantheon would be a better one. But I guess I'm asking about the different groups of spirits or types of entities that a spiritualist house might have a connection to or emphasize contacting on the other side. 
Because my thought is that a group is usually working from specific grimoires, maybe. Mm -hmm. They might focus on communication with the dead, or another discipline might work with archangels or planetary energies or mm -hmm. bigger archetypal forces. Mm -hmm. I'm sure some traditions brought their gods and spirits from where they were before. To reference Brujo Luis again, he talked about a kind of spirit I'd never heard about called Madamas. I mean, really, they're dead humans, but he said that they're very potent, powerful spirits that were apparently the mothers of children that were being shipped off into slavery. Sometimes they drowned their own children to save them from the horrors ahead. It's pretty sad and heavy stuff, but the more I learn about ancestors, spiritual traditions, and spirits of a people or of the land, it seems like a microcosm like Puerto Rico would be pretty wild. So these groups I'm used to hearing about, like the Golden Dawn, Enochian magic, they all focus on working with their own spiritual forces. I guess I would ask, is there a difference between the spirits of different branches of voodoo or Santeria and the spirits that your own house tends to work with? So there are several things, madamas and different types of spirits. They have to do with a court and each person has a court is born and has a, a number of spirits, uh, typically seven, sometimes nine. And they're the spirits that surround you kind of like uh, spirit allies, allies. And so these are the court ancestors. Everyone works with ancestors. That's, that is the, the core of, uh, spiritism, you know, with a Mesa Blanca, you know, the white altar, which is, you know, the fount of water always. And typically a cross, a metal cross, the prayer book is sometimes a goblet of water or, you know, it depends. Uh, some people put offerings on that altar, others don't, but that is the altar where you interact with ancestors and you honor that. But the courts, it's not so much a hierarchy, although there are, there is a principal spirit that you have that is the the main one the the top one i guess is the the, the best way to say it the main one the the, the holy guardian angel or the 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 guardian angel <laughs> not let me not say the holy guardian angel i don't want to get into that but the, the guardian <laughs> angel which is the the principal spirit and then you have the court which is all the spirits that are your allies you know, they bring different things into the mix and they contribute to different things into your quadro, who you are, what your vision is in life, what you do in life and how you move forward and elevation. There are many, many layers to this. Um, when you typically go to Misa, there you work Las Causas, which is, uh, I guess, the, the, the Direct translation is causes, but it's not a cause. <laughs> it's more you address issues. Sometimes it's issues with different types of spirits. Uh, you could consider this, however problematic, uh, lower level spirits, and uh, you elevate them. It goes by each individual. That's what you work in in these uh, misas. And sometimes, you know, you also address things in the uh, issues with the spirit uh, in the courts in the courts of each individual. So things like that. It's more of like, you know, like going to, I don't know, a doctor, you know, <laughs> you address spiritual issues, you know, sure. spiritual things that need addressing, you know, sometimes, you know, someone threw you the evil eye and you have things going on, bad luck in your life. And so it, it's addressed in these sessions, but hierarchy. Yeah. There is a type of hierarchy and spirits you work with. There's Sanse, you know, that's outside my bounds. I don't know, you know, but there are different types of spirits. There's 21 Divisiones, which has uh, the mysteries, the 21 mysteries. And there are different types of spirits in general, as far as spiritism goes. There's the Cuadro, there's the Ancestor Altar, and they're, you know, they're separate typically. You know, the Mesa Blanca, where you work with ancestors, and then the Cuadro, which is your, your saints, your allies, and you... Some people don't have altars to them. Others typically do. And, you know, they take on the face of saints, different type of spirits, indigenous spirits and, yeah, madamas. Mm -hmm. Right on. So 
I mean, the court's idea is pretty interesting. I've obviously heard of spirit allies, but how does one determine their court or what court they're connected to? Do you go to an, an expert who tells you? Typically, yes. So it, it requires a specific type of MISA to investigate your court. But if you belong to a spiritual house, then slowly by little, uh, slowly little by little, you start knowing, you know, the more you interact, the more you get, you know, you, you learn about spirits and interact with your own spirits and learn and grow, then you kind of start knowing who they are. And then it's always good to get you know, if, if one is interested, so if you belong to a spirit, spiritist house, then you would get, by your godmother or godfather, you would get the investigation, which they look into who your court is mm-hmm. specifically. Mm-hmm. And a mesa is basically like a magical session, I guess I would, I would say. Yeah. Brujo Luis kind of breaks it down as three different stages. You open with a prayer. Then you do some like kind of cleaning, you use some waters to uh, purify, to clean. And then that's when the real work begins. But he describes some pretty intense stuff. I mean, really intense channeling, Mm -hmm. mounting of the medium. Yes. I mean, it seems pretty wild. And I think a lot of times American culture just kind of, it hurts the potency of magic because it is so loud and bright. And (laughs) from what the interviews I've had it seems like spirits are pretty sensitive to certain things and you really do need quiet stillness isolation to a degree i mean they're trying to penetrate a realm that necessarily isn't really theirs or or we're trying to penetrate theirs so it's hard to really get a strong connection and with a lot of distractions around but the stuff he describes is pretty wild i mean have you seen any particularly potent spirit contact Yes, indeed. <laughs> yes, and you'd be surprised. I mean, yes, spir- some spirits with everything, you know. You know, there there are different different spirits, different people, different animals, different. There's differences everywhere, you know. Right, there are right. different types of things in in this world. I like to say um, in Spanish, "Hay de todo en la viña del Señor," which is a, a Bible verse, I believe, or a, a saying. Which basically means there, there's everything in the, in the, in the, everything. (laughs) There's every type of everything. (laughs) Everything is, I guess, you can see. So you'd be surprised because these, some of these, especially the, when there's a special misas held or special festivities held, it gets pretty loud and there's no, uh, you know, and it, it, you know, with the music, there's music and there's still, you know, people that, that mount spirits. So it's not, you know, it, it just, there's different types of spirits, but there is, when you go to a misa, tends to be a small group. Although, you know, in the templos, they are larger, there is an order. And so the head medium was the one that oversees the whole, the whole uh, misa. But uh, there is quiet. That's why you begin with prayers. And one should, you know, the, ideally, one should be in a state of meditation. I mean, you don't go full meditation. You have to be aware of what's going on. But, you know, what, of attention is the best word. One should be in a state of attention to be aware, etc., and quiet. But that's not always the case. You know, sometimes, you know, it gets loud and, you know, spirits do still show up. And especially if spirits show up, you know, the getting loud possibility is definitely a thing. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. So it's not, you know, it's not, it's not set in stone. It's not one thing or the other, you know. Right, right. And I know it's also usually a pretty personal or private type situation, but in terms of mounting spirits or just spirit contact, I'm always really interested in trying to solidify like what their personalities are like or what kind of messages come from these entities. Because I haven't had a lot of personal experience. I really just get stories from people who are more embedded in that environment. And I guess, are there any kind of messages that you've seen or maybe intense mountings where you've felt like you were in, you're talking to a spirit directly? Because of course, the personality of the person gets kind of out of the way. These things are vague to a lot of people who haven't 
point blank experienced spirit communication. Have you ever gotten any any messages or seen messages come out in a group that were interesting? Yeah, no, of course. I mean, that's that's the whole that's uh, one of the major points of having a spirit mount or having that type of interaction is for the message. You know, if a spirit mounts is to bring a message, sometimes mediums pass la causa, you know, the lower level spirit, they pass them through their body, you know, and they give them resolution. And so, yeah, there's, there's always a message. There's always a message. There's always, you know, a conversation, I guess, you know. So what kind of feel do you get from the messages that the spirits think are so important? Are they sometimes dark and menacing and grandiose? Are they personally directed to people in the room? Are they more like what you hear from ET contactees that we need to change our ways and be (laughs) stewards of the land? I know they're all different, but are there certain themes in these messages that maybe come out more than others? No, it's it's typically practical. If it's a lower level spirit, a causa, that is being lifted from a person and it and uh, the medium is mounted or this the person, etc. Uh, there it gets dark, you know? <laughs> it gets dark in a sense that the, the, what they're saying is is you know, sometimes violent, some uh, definitely just violent yeah unwelcome but when it is a spirit an ancestor from the cuadro or a higher you know a higher level spirit they come with a message for sometimes the group typically the group or let me say sometimes a group or an individual or two individuals and it's typically practical you know it's uh it's practical like pointing at uh, uh, things that need to be looked at and addressed in a person's life or spiritual life that need work and that need attention. So it's it's definitely typically practical. And there is evidencia. Evidencia is where it is confirmed through another or through, you know. So there is, yeah, there is confirmation there in, in that sense with in spirit interaction. Mm-hmm. Right on. So – To get into tarot a bit, obviously, we've talked about it on the show before. A lot of listeners are familiar with the basics, but why does tarot resonate so strongly with you? And how do you understand the mechanisms behind why it does seem to yield some truly meaningful insights? Okay, so this is a little aside from spirituality. But I do bring it in and involve it in spirituality. So tarot for me is a language, plain and simple. (laughs) It is a language, a visual language that – so when you look at the cards, you ask a question. (laughs) Typically, it is a practical question. And these images arise. And I think the beauty of tarot is when the person reading the cards is able to see the answer, you know, in a way that not, you know, in a very precise way, you know, in a way that helps you recontextualize your question. And obviously you always answer your question because a tarot reading for me always starts with a question. But the beauty of tarot is that since it is a, a language, another type of language, a visual language, a language of forms, then it is a way to step outside of your normal language words and you see the visual and you see things often, you know, it, it you answer, the reader answers qu- the question in seeing things that they might have not seen or noticed or been aware of. That's, I guess, the initial what I feel tarot is at base level. It is a visual language of forms. And the form can take on many things. That's why I really like the Marseille or even playing cards because it is, it's so malleable. You know, you can take uh, these these sticks, for example, batons or these swords, and they can. And then when you see them progress, I also don't I don't read one single card. You see them progress because for me, since it is a language, you have to see how it moves from card to card. You know, and and so when you see it 
transform into another image and another image. I don't know. There's a poetical or lyrical beauty to that. And when you use it to answer questions, I mean, it, it the insight is, is it cuts, you know, really deep. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I think that's good about, you know, reading more than one card. I mean, if it is a language, it's better to communicate in sentences than single words. Yeah. And because you have a pretty robust education in literature and an interest in the esoteric, I'm curious to hear your thoughts on like archetypes and narrative and how deeply they might be entangled with our lives and reality. Because I've heard people say that the universe runs on narrative and archetype. Do you feel the same way? Yes, I do. I do. And I and it's because for me, the universe, the way I see it is lyrical. The universe is, is in constant conversation. And, and I don't want to say universe in, you know, some far off abstract way, but life, you know, all these beings and spirits and, you know, everything that we're interacting every day with our bodies are interacting with our bodies are living in, in this, you know, temporally here. And, and there is a constant conversation going on, you know, that is very lyrical. And often the way I see archetypes, and I, I haven't really studied uh, a lot of Jung. <laughs> what I know of Jung is what Gordon White has talked about. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, for me, archetypes is that language, that lyricism it's just another word for this this upwelling this this l discourse that we catch yeah. and the way that's why i at, at one point in my blog i would i would always emphasize paying attention being aware but it it it's because of this you know when you live more aware when you pay attention instead of you know in some abstract things and all these symbols and you know and all these you know, and in the case of tarot, you know, all these meanings and significations that someone said and someone said and another said and another. When you just pay attention, you see that it is all just there, you know, and that, that you don't need to come up with these significations and all this added baggage. It's just there. Just read. Just read the language. Read the images, read the forms that are in constant conversation and in, in constant interaction and tension. And that's, that's, that's for me what archetype is, is the upwelling of that. And that's why tarot, I think, is, is enduring. It is a pack of cards that they converse through, through image. They're very nicely packed in 78, you know, 78 cards. And it's just, uh, it's, it's, it's a useful tool, a useful interface for that. Right on. And so to get a little more into that post that I liked so much, the politics of unnamed desires, the post was largely about recent protests in Puerto Rico. And you say around half a million people congealed to dethrone the governor for a level of blatant corruption and disregard for the people of the island. And I'm sure we're all familiar with puppet leaders who just serve the larger empire or people in power who are very disrespectful to the people they're supposed to be nurturing. Mm -hmm. But what can you tell us about maybe those protests for a lot of Americans who probably weren't even aware half a million people congealed to dethrone a governor? What were those protests about? And has there been any real resolution now since it has been a bit of time since you wrote that? Mm hmm. Yeah. Yeah, I did consider writing a follow-up post, but I left it unfinished. So what happened is that, well, there was already a lot of displeasure with the governor. You know, he was incompetent. He was appointing people in his uh, cabinet and, in, and that were just stealing from the community, from the general people of the island. And, um, you know, uh, many schools have been closing for years, you know, public schools. So there was just a, a lot of discontent. A lot of people were unhappy. But it's nothing new, you know, with every new governor people are unhappy, but, you know, it's but in this one it was that chat. <laughs> it was the chat that was published by El Nuevo Día, one of our newspapers, and it was a very obscene chat, that private chat, obviously, between the governor and some of his buddies in power. It was very disrespectful to the communities. 
LGBTQ communities, communities of different mobilities, you know, the dead that were that went unburied and unfollowed up with after the hurricane. And it was just very disgusting. Many people, they obviously many people read it and they were scandalized by by the blatant disregard from those in power. And I I just think, you know, it's always been the case. Just They just now saw it in print. <laughs> they just now could not avoid recognizing it. You know, many groups uh, mobilized through social media and locally and uh, the protests happened. So many protests, many protests happened, not just the one that I spoke of. Many, many did. There were protests in the in Old San Juan, in La Fortaleza, which is where the governor lives. And it was uh, it went on for quite a few days. Yeah. Hmm. And obviously the other component to that post is your insights from tarot. And I guess I'm curious how that maybe helped you get a deeper understanding of what was going on there. Of course, I read the post, but for people who are maybe trying to understand how the tarot can get you a deeper understanding of something that's kind of abstract, that isn't such a personal thing, like where am I going to find love or what's my next job? What kind of insights did the tarot yield for you in terms of trying to maybe get a better grip on the depth of this discontent and the reason for the protest? So I I read tarot for context. When I read tarot and the questions I – when I, I myself go to the cards or where someone else comes to me, that's why I emphasize the question, I look at context. For me, tarot is – is the perfect, what is it, uh, the lens for, for context. So you want to see, you know, I don't, I don't want to talk about, I don't want to look at, you know, how myself and my identity and all these things are moving. And it's always good, yeah, but it's not – that's not important because identity is such a malleable thing and it's always, you know, transforming and interacting with the greater, you know, with uh, what is experiential in the landscape, etc. So I, I read tarot for context. So I look at what the context is, what's going on beyond what is seen superficially, you know? Mm-hmm. And so when I, when I read the cards, that's what I wanted to look at. I wanted to look at what is really going on, you know, what is, what is really happening and what is going to happen, you know, is it just, is this just all for show or is this, you know, is there really potential for change here or not? (laughs) Mm -hmm. And so that's why, that's why I read the cards and it was useful. I mean, I don't want to disparage the protest. I don't, I'm going to have so many people. (laughs) I don't want to disparage the protest because it helps it helps solidify a people, you know, and help people see, you know, the people that are that live in this island and also outside because there were a lot of people that traveled into the island to participate that, you know, that we can do something, that we can get together, that we can mobilize. So it is important. You know, it is it is a good thing. You know, there are good things that came out of it. I don't know. There should be more. Mm-hmm. For me, there should be more. And so what the cards indicated is that, you know, this is just another step in the process. And and now and now as things stand, really, there's someone else that came into a lady. She was a secretary of justice. She just took up the, you know, the, the seat of power, I guess you could say. Mm-hmm. But now, you know. Now you have just another person there, (laughs) another person there and things continue. And I, there, I know there's, and I notice it when I read the newspaper, um, that there is an emphasis and look, we're, you know, this is what she's doing. This is what her cabinet is doing. Look at all these changes. But really what's coming to light is that there is a lot of steps, procedures, bureaucracy in place that, incapacitates the 
people. Mm -hmm. And so now we're, you know, we're in the process. She's in the process. So the government is in the process of getting more federal money, having that federal money go to the places that need it. But now the different uh, municipalities and the, the mayors of the municipalities are saying that the money isn't reaching them. So they're not able to fix the roads and the homes, etc. And so it's just a big web in place that makes it really hard to address address issues that we have as an island, you know, poverty and, and, and things that need to be fixed. Mm -hmm. I'm sure, you know, the phrase that people use here, well, obviously the machine is bigger than any one person, but the phrase you always hear is, Hey, meet the new boss. Same as the old boss. Yeah, basically that's how it feels like for me. I mean, you know, politics here is such a, polemic you know it's such a volatile thing that some people you know for them something is happening in my opinion no mm -hmm. no it's just just continue in as normal and now that we're talking about parceling out different you know restructuring the land a planification committee that way make it more accessible for outside companies to buy land and make, you know, paradise here for, you know, hotels and things like that. So, you right. know, that's the things that, that bother me, you know, if I'm really frank and this is, you know, this is probably not welcome sentiment or acknowledged. If I'm really frank, I think all that is useless. You know, I think, I think all of these attempts at making a, a, a better place, you know, in, in government wise and putting all these steps into place is just putting more procedures and more steps for someone else to come in, buy the land and make, you know, a paradise for someone else. Mm -hmm. And it's it's just it's insufficient. That's why I think it's more important for each in, each individual. That's why I it has to be each individual that decolonizes. That each individual goes through the process of decolonization, that of, of of seeing things as they are, not living in this fantasy land. Because half the people here are living in this fantasy land. You know that we can. We can continue living off of the milk that comes from uh, the U.S., you know, the federal government. And it's just insufficient, insufficient. In, a, in, a, in all our food, a lot, a great portion of our food comes from ships, you know, when each one of us can. And there are communities mobilizing, you know, you know, agricultural communities. Yes, but. No, there should, there needs to be more. How can, how can we be destabilized? You know, when we can grow food, we can create communities that provide for these things when a hurricane happens, because hurricanes are going to continue happening. People pretend that we live in a bubble, but we live in the Caribbean and hurricanes pass through here. So they will continue passing through here as normal and they will most likely get worse. So, you know, it's, we don't, we don't see the real picture, the big picture. We don't see things as they are. And that's why I think we, each individual, this is me saying it, but I cannot, you know, I cannot make someone else go through a process. You know, this is just how I view it. You know, mm -hmm. this is what is important to me. The process of decolonizing the self, of seeing things as they are, and of removing all this baggage of shit <laughs> yeah, yeah yeah well that's kind of what i you know when we started talking about colonization and the magical community and you know i mentioned that you use a spanish tarot deck and it's kind of like it, it's it's so ingrained that it's hard to reverse engineer it's hard to really unravel all the effects of it and maybe that's not the goal maybe that shouldn't be the goal like you mentioned the decolonization of the mind Maybe it should just be that. It should be like, we can't change the past. We're not going to ever return to a pure and untainted Puerto Rico and Puerto Rican culture. You know, it's always going to have these influences that have been brought in. And I guess that's everywhere. And is that really the end of the world? I mean, I guess it just is what it is. But decolonizing the individual and how you look at that is probably the important step to take. 
Yeah, no, and I'm not, you know, I'm not, I'm not saying we should go back to a, a pristine place. We're, you know, we're never, we've never been pristine. You know, we've been moving from place to place and interacting. You know, we've never been pristine. There's no such thing as pristine nature. No, what I mean is that is understanding our place, knowing where we are, and thinking, okay, what can we do? What can I do? Because I can you know, force anyone next to me, what can I do, you know, and find what you can do for yourself and for your life and for your family to make it clear, to make it just more, and I don't want to say authentic because that's just as overused, but just to, just to have clarity, to know where you stand, to know where you are, to know who you are and what is around you, you know, Mm -hmm, and where mm -hmm. the land that you walk on, obviously that is very important for me, (laughs) the land. (laughs) And so, you know, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not saying that everyone should go back to a pristine place, but I'm saying everyone should be honest with themselves and, and learn to pay attention and learn to be aware and learn to be in place and be in body in place because, you know, instead of living in some fantasy land, you know, especially now with cell phones and, you know, I, I very much agree with Peter Gray's sentiments, you know, society of uh, the of surfaces, <laughs> no substance. <laughs> so it's, it's definitely the case here as well. And especially since school, you know, since very early age, they're telling you all these stories that are dissonant with the land that you walk on, the place that you live and who you are. You ask half the people here when there are polls, are you white? Are you this? And a lot of them will say white, you know, and it's just funny. I mean, you know, okay, there, there are white people here as in the color, but you know, it's just, I don't know. I think (laughs) it's more, it's, it's, it's more. Yeah, well, I really think you're on a roll here, and I do think that this stuff is super important. You mentioned getting your food from ships, and that's a big thing. Like, what is a better reaction if you're angry at the Empire and you want things to be decolonized ultimately? Is it better to protest in the streets and then go have a Coca-Cola that came off that ship? Or is it better to just stay at home, take care of your family, and have a community garden? Yeah, exactly. You know? <laughs> See, that's what I'm thinking. That's more along the lines of what I'm thinking. You know, how can you, how can you stop relying on a system and an infrastructure that is insufficient, that will not support you, that will not work for you, that will not serve you, that will not help you? You know, when when all this this lady that's now in power, Wanda Vasquez, I think her name is. There were ships that had goods and supplies for us that did not make it to the community, you know, because of some b- procedure, bureaucracy, bureaucracy, order, I don't know, but they didn't make it, you know, to us, to the community that needed, that needed it. So we had to figure out how to live amongst ourselves and help ourselves, you know, help each other and help the other and this one next to me and this, you know, and that's what I think we should, we need to learn to do yes because you know another hurricane happens another catastrophe happens and uh, what are we going to do you know buy a lot of water bottles and create more trash and when the water bottles run out have no water and you know eat canned food you know from where what if when the canned food is over and now gas is going to go up so food is going to go up here it just it's just made – the system is made to fail. Right. To fail for us. And also to cripple independence. Yeah. I mean you can't be independent and also suckle from the teat of the big machine. You can't do both, you know? Yeah, no, definitely you can't do both. No. <laughs> and there always is going to be another corrupt leader. There is always going to be another hurricane, as you say. And it's like – the system keeps you weak, but comfortable to a degree. Mm-hmm. And some of the things you have to do to get away from it are uncomfortable. It's not super fun to go farm every day, and you know, unless that's your passion. But it can be a lot easier to go down to the 7-Eleven instead. Yeah. But it's all wrapped up in one thing. It's a mindset. You have to really free your mind before you can really free yourself. Because it's like, 
you can't be dependent on the system if you're going to rebel against it, like you're saying. Yeah. And I'm not saying, you know, there are, you have to know. I think each individual has to know the cards they're playing. So let's say I want to step away or I want to find more ways that I, as a person, that my body is sovereign. So how can I do it in a system that I still have to participate in as well? So you have to know the cards that you're playing, you know, and that yeah. brings a certain level of cunning that you have to bring into play as well, you know, that you have to know the cards you're playing, you know, when, you know, you're kid if you have a kid and still has to go to school you know so you have to know how you're going to build and and create your life in a way that that is sovereign but also aware of the place and the state that things are and where you live because you still have to participate in a way you know, if you live far or work far, you still need a car. You still need to fix the car and buy gas. You know, so you have to, one has, this is why extremes are insufficient. Extremes do not, are not the answer because you have to know the cars that you have, what can you do and what can't you do? Right. Also, I wanted to ask on a more practical, you know, in a more practical sense, when it comes to people in Puerto Rico, of course, it's hard to summarize what a people think. And I know you've been very careful to try to only speak for, for yourself and not other people. Yeah. But in terms of Puerto Rico's nebulous state, to some, being a state would be further colonization. To become part of the United States would be the wrong direction. But maybe it's better than the nebulous zone it's in. And I think completely removing the American presence, especially suddenly, would hurt a lot of people as it would anywhere uh, when they're dependent on a system. Mm -hmm. But is there a popular opinion amongst the people of what they would prefer? Would they prefer statehood or would they prefer America to just leave them alone? I mean, what do you think that the most the sentiment is that's most popular? Oh man, this is the this is a, an issue, a very contentious issue. It just depends who's in power because there are several political parties, big politi political parties. There's the one, the red one, the popular party, which says, let's stay where we are. There's the blue one. Uh, <laughs> and they want to be part, they want to be a state. And there's the green one, that they want independence. And I say it in colors because it's the easiest way. <laughs> to, and I think that... I think the majority of people are divided. <laughs> I can't say either way. I think there's a big division between the ones that want to keep the nebulous zone and the ones that want to be a part, that, to be a state. The ones that want independence, they've sort of, that, that movement that movement has suffered a lot of misinformation and a lot of violence. And so it, it, it's quite sad. So there's not a lot of people don't, many people don't admit that they want that or would consider that. And typically in the polls, I think they've done a couple surveys. They did a survey recently on this and I think that was divided, mostly wanted, like for a little bit of difference in percentage, wanted statehood. I believe, I could be wrong, but I believe that, you know, we can do these surveys and it can be decided by X amount of people that we want statehood. But then, you know, we also have to hear from the federal government if this will be legitimate, if they will look at these surveys, you know, at this poll that was done and the people's opinion. So it's divided. It's really divided. And for me personally, I don't care. If we are yeah. a state, if we remain, if we, you know, become independent, I don't care because I think that what we need to be focusing on is, like I mentioned, our own selves, our own place, our own land. How do we take care of it? Because what is the point of becoming independent and we can't even subsist? We don't even know how to, you know, we don't. I've heard people say, oh, my gosh, can you imagine that my my son grows up to have to be a farmer? That's terrible. You know, I've huh. heard people say that, you know, there's many stigmas around just 
Puerto Rico and living in Puerto Rico and being part of the land. And, um, and so I really don't care either way. Personally, I don't, I could care less for <laughs> me, for me, what I care about is that how do we take care of the land that we say we love? You know, how do we, how do we not take care in the sense that we are here, we are put here as saviors to take care of the land? I don't mean like that. But how do we know the land? How do we interact and respect the land, the soil? You know, we have, all our rivers are polluted. Where are we going to get water from? You know, and it's just, it just makes no sense. We're talking about all these political issues when we don't even address the ones here in the land. And that's what I care about, mostly the land. <laughs> that's what I care about. That's what, what I want to see. People looking at the land and seeing how they can be better stewards of the, of the land that they live in. Yes. Cheers to that. I am in complete agreement. And I'm sure if I was in that situation, that's how I'd, I would feel. I don't ever get what I want politically anyway. So <laughs> right. I just stop p paying attention and do my own thing. And I know I've taken up a lot of your time. This is the last kind of weird question I wanted to ask you before we just wrap up with your links and stuff. But clearly you're aware of a lot of the dark underbelly of the empire and the abuses of people who don't have much of a voice. And of course, the Jeffrey Epstein story has been so huge lately. I only bring it up because Little St. James is like the closest island to Puerto Rico. And I'm just curious if people in Puerto Rico are, are responding to the story in any interesting ways or if that proximity has come up at all as far as you've seen. Nope. <laughs> <laughs> nope. I don't know if many people are aware maybe uh, some, a select few, a small group. And if they are, they looked at it, they went, oh my God, that's disgusting. And then j j they just kept going. Because like I said, they all the stories that are filtered to the general population is a, f it's a fairy tale. It's, it's <laughs> just, they only look at you know, oh, this great empire, oh, this, you know, and I don't want to say that all Puerto Ricans are just subservient, but, and because it's, that's not the case, but very many of them do not look at things as they are. Mm -hmm. So no, I don't many, I don't know that many are aware of that. I've never heard that in conversation. I don't, I've never seen it in the, in the newspaper. If it showed up, it was a very small article. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I I don't I'm not surprised because I often don't know what's going in, on in the next town or, <laughs> or state, so I can only imagine the next island. But I figured I had to ask. The world's a big place, mm -hmm. and these two islands are very close, and uh, that other one's on the minds of a lot of people now. Mm -hmm. It's worth asking. So anyway, this has been really enjoyable. I think everybody listening had a good time. Before we call it Oops. in. Do tell us about your <laughs> writings or your PDFs that you have or anything on Mist and Ether. Just anything you might want them to know about digging more into what you do or if you do any kind of readings or anything like that. Yeah, well, I don't uh, at the moment do readings online. I do them live. So here in Puerto Rico, <laughs> I do have uh, PDFs that you can download of what I've done with the tarot. And basically, I have the Poetic Arcanum, which is just a look at the majors, the trumps, and what they, who they are using the cards to answer that question, the cards themselves. I also have, and so these PDFs, you can go on my website, mistinether.com or .wordpress.com. So I have those PDFs that you can go ahead and download and print available. I also have an otherworldly journey with a suit of swords. So it's just um, cartomantic explorations, I guess you could say, through the lens of uh, poetry. I also have a piece that is part of 21 plus 1. Uh, Camilia Elias edited the Fortune Teller's Manifesto. And I have that. I also have a, a story being published by uh, The Fiddler's Green coming out uh, next year. The Fiddler's Green Parish uh, Magazine, which is a zine. But yeah, you can just basically go to mistandether.wordpress.com and everything is there. Everything that I do. And I also have, you know, all my social media, you know, connections there as well. And uh, for now, that's all I do. And I and I, I wanted to keep it simple 
and not, I'm not big on promoting myself <laughs> on social media. So I wanted to keep it simple. I have that blog because I like to write and I love the cards and I like to write about the cards and I also like books and I like to write about books as well and review things and just talk about these things. And so it's all there. And that's basically where you can find me. I am also, I think I'm, I'm on Twitter <laughs> and Instagram, you know, regular places, not on Facebook. And that's it. That's all. That's all I have uh, upcoming for now. I'm still writing. I like I dream of uh, finishing a collection of short stories. And so that's it. That's, that's all for now. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. Well, I do really like your blog. I've enjoyed the parts of animating the tarot pips that you've put up. Since we've been in communication, I've taken a look at your monthly forecast in the couple months that I've been able to digest it in real time. And I think that's a lot of fun. I try to fold that into what I expect the month to look like. And of course, an otherworldly journey with the suit of swords is, is a blast too. So I think people find a lot of stuff there to like. You're a really good writer. I hope you have a lot of success and get some good feedback from this. Thank you. Thank you. I hope so too. Thank you. Well, thanks again. I know it's a marathon session around here. I really appreciate your time and your work. Keep fighting the good fight and take care. Thank you. All right, Greg. And that is how we do it, people. Natalia L40 of Mist and Ether. I hope you had a good time. I know she was a little nervous, as anyone would be with their first interview, especially on a show that you've listened to before. And I thought she did as great as anyone would. Of course, she never claimed to be an expert or an authority on Caribbean magic traditions or spirit contact or the politics of Puerto Rico, but I still thought she had a lot of insights to share, a lot of similar interests to THC listeners, and just being embedded in that environment is interesting to people who probably haven't been. Just the difference in culture that everybody has some type of spirit belief is pretty foreign. But I've always liked bringing in people who haven't done previous interviews. It's fun to have conversations that aren't entirely mapped out in my head beforehand. And I've always liked the surprise element of THC. When a new episode comes out and you don't know the name, you're like, wow, what is this? It's fun. And I knew it was going to be more conversational because this whole thing stemmed from a single blog post, which is already light for the full focus of a two-hour interview, but it was also a post that was outside of the norm for her. So this post, The Politics of Unnamed Desire, it really took on a life of its own, and look at it now. I also read it at a time when I was thinking about the negative feedback over some guests or topics that don't seem relevant to anyone outside of the U.S., or one guy said THC is the first world problems of conspiracy podcasts, and it's hard to know what string of shows brought that comment on, but people are often saying to me, oh gee, another old white guy on the higher side chats, interesting, which I think is just as demeaning as anything if you're really going to judge people as individuals. It's like, so as an individual, this old white guy can't have something valuable to say because there are a lot of other old white guys saying things. It's just never good to judge people by that shit. But regardless, I do get it. And I've tried to diversify the lineup a little bit lately. We've added a few more ladies and tried to talk about some stuff that might be more universally relevant. Or like today tried to hone in on a pocket of the world that isn't thought about enough, but is just as affected by the empire, maybe more so than most pockets of the world. And then, of course, Natalia is also knowledgeable about cartomancy, tarot, and spiritualism. So we went for it, and I liked it. This was my first show that I recorded since being back from Austin and Gordon's As Above event, so a lot of this stuff was fresh on my mind and appropriate, because she, of course, follows their work, too. See, so if you liked her vibe, mistandether.wordpress.com is where you can read more. Links in the show notes, as always. 
But just like Whitney Webb, it's important to acknowledge that the system does damage to a lot of people in places that are outside of it. I think most Americans would agree that we get some benefits. I mean, you got to be pretty dense to not admit that we get some benefits. And outside of our system, it's just all costs. I don't know. We want to try to make sure we're covering as much diverse ground as we can and make sure that we're not just turning over the same five rocks week after week. Also, I know we have listeners in Puerto Rico, and I'm sure they'll be happy to see this pop up. And I really respect Natalia's efforts to not speak for other people, especially people who oftentimes don't get to speak for themselves. It's a tough thing to navigate because we do it without even noticing sometimes. We generalize and oversimplify. And when a sentence starts with, it seems like all the people want, no matter what you're talking about, you're probably wrong. That was just another element of the conversation that came into play today. But as always, THD interviews are two hours instead of just the one if you are a Plus member. And in today's, we talked about how to find your agency within the landscape you're in, Natalia's monthly tarot forecasts, her favorite decks, and why they seem more potent, St. Cyprian, tips for ancestral contact, understanding the life-death cycle with Natalia's added spiritual context, what trends she sees coming in magic, and a little bit about how racism or colonization might color our outlook on indigenous magical traditions. It's that pesky colonization of the mind, let me tell you. There's actually an author from Kenya, he's in his 80s, but he wrote a book called Decolonizing the Mind, The Politics of Language in African Literature, and I tried to track him down for an interview, and I haven't heard back yet, but that is a great, intriguing book title. In Higher Side News, the developers are... Definitely done with the work. I've got a few more things to do on my side. Emails related to the changes are still coming in, but I've got about 95% of people answered and their problems solved. But now it's sort of crunch time for the end of the month here. So I should have this last show out on Monday. Actually, I have to, but it's a good one with a returning guest to talk about the corrupt banking system and some more advantageous banking structures that have been tried and make life a lot better for the people in them than the fractional reserve debt-based system of rule we have now. So stay tuned, same bat time, same bat channel, and I'll see you then. I've done my part. Your move, agents of the empire, silencers of voices, and colonizers of the Caribbean. Your fucking sweet dreams to the elite. We're calling them out on TAC, uncovering secrets and conspiracies. Everybody's looking for something. Some of them want to use you, some of them want to get used by you, some of them want to abuse you. Some of them want to be abused.